Okay, welcome to the uh, September 5th meeting for the Planning Commission, and we'll call the meeting to order. And Chloe, could we get a roll call? Yes. Commissioner Ruth? Here. Commissioner Newman? Here. Commissioner Christensen? Here. Commissioner Wilk? Here. Chair Welch? Here, thanks. Thank you. And now we'll do the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. We have a, actually a few people in the audience tonight. So um, this meeting is Cablecast Live on Charter Communications, Cable TV Channel 8 and AT&T U-verse Channel 99. I still can't guarantee <coughs> that's the case, but... Uh, it's also been recorded to be replayed on the following Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Meetings can also be viewed from the city's website at www.cityofcapitola.org, uh, org, I'm sorry. And our technician tonight is Lynn Dutton. And if you could just make sure your phone is silenced, um, that would be great. And if you choose to come up and speak tonight, we're going to ask that you just state your name at the podium there and sign in for us. So. Um, next, we'll move on to oral communications. Uh, do we have any additions or deletions to tonight's agenda? Thank you. Um, we have received three public comments on item 5B, 1440 41st Avenue, since the packet went out. Those were distributed to the Planning Commission and are available at the back okay. table. Thank you. Um, next is an uh, opportunity for public comment. This public comment period is for those items that are not on tonight's agenda. So if you have an item you'd like to speak to us, about that is not on the agenda tonight. This is your oppor opportunity to come up and, uh, and speak to us. Okay, not seeing none, we'll uh, come back and open up for commission comments. It's gonna be a quick meeting. Okay, no commission comments, we'll move on to staff comments. No staff comments. Okay, that will <coughs> move us right into item three, approval of the minutes. We have two sets of uh, uh, minutes to be approved. Um, for our meeting on July 18th, and one for August 1st. Uh, first, can I get a motion or discussion or? Yes. Motion? Can one motion cover both of them? Yes. I, I need to abstain from A. Oh. Why well, we need to hold it in two bits. Okay, so we'll take them separate. Yeah, we'll take them separate. So approval for the meeting of July 18th. Okay. A second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And one abstention. And one abstention. Okay, and next for approval of our minutes from August 1st. Move approval. So we have a motion. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, the next item is uh, item four is our consent calendar. The items on the consent calendar are voted in one motion normally, but uh, we do have an, uh, um, one of our commissioners will have to recuse himself, so we're going to take it in two motions. The first motion we'll do is uh, for items A and C for 523 Riverview to continue it and for 620 Oak Drive. Um, I move consent. Oh wait, you want to I, I do, you know what, I need to, I need to open so make sure there's no one in the audience. Is it, would any of our planning commissioners like to pull any of the items from consent? How about anybody from the audience that would like to pull one of the items uh, on the calendar, the consent calendar. TJ, I have a do do have a question on the Oak Drive application. Okay. It's just a, a question on the on the deck. Is the wall fence, or the wall screen around the deck? Is that on just the south side, or is it on both sides, south and east? It's my understanding that it's just on the south side. Just on the south side. Correct. And the back on the east side. Then is that commercial property? Yes. Okay. Correct. Okay, is there anyone from the audience that would like to talk about 620 Oak? Yep, we can pull that. Nope. We have a member that would like to talk about it. So uh, you can come on up. Is This is the time, and so I think maybe we'll pull that item um, real quick. Get rid of the consent items in there. Yeah, you know, let me, let me, I'm kind of not messed up in my little organization tonight. Let me do this. We're gonna we're gonna go on with the consent item, so we'll get the vote, and then we'll we'll pull that item for you to speak about. Okay, so we're gonna talk about 523 uh, Riverview for the consent item. I'll move approval. We have a motion. 
And a second. And a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 This is to continue, correct? Yeah. To continue, yes. And then the second item would be B, which is Fanmar, and Commissioner Wilk will recuse himself due to proximity. So we can that, take a motion for that. I have a motion to approve. Okay, second. so we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye, Aye with one uh, abstention. So now we'll move on to item five, public hearings, and we'll just move uh, 620 Oak is the first item there. Um, and is, I'm sorry, sir, if you want to come up now, you can <laughs> go through the process. And something to think about as you're coming up here, is this a statement, a request, in, because if we can go <coughs> formally through the whole staff report. Well, I guess I'm just trying to find out if it's just a simple statement, a concern, if it's a concern, a concern, okay. Then we'll just go ahead and do the full staff report and go through the process and then we'll call <laughs> you up your next. <laughs> I'll get you up one more time. <laughs> Good evening, Planning Commissioners and Chair Welch. The applicant is requesting a design permit to remodel an existing non-conforming single-story single-family residence. The remodel includes the addition of a second story and modifications to a detached garage. The project is located at 620 Oak Drive within the R1 single-family residential zoning district. The project adds 1,039 square feet to the residence and 18 square feet to the detached garage. <laughs> This is the single story residence as it exists today. The home is non-conforming because it encroaches into the front and side setbacks. Rather than modify the residence under the 80% non-conforming structural alterations limit, the applicant chose to bring the structure into compliance by removing the front and side encroachments. Additionally, the non-conforming detached garage will be expanded to meet covered parking dimension requirements. Proposed height is 24 feet and 6 inches. The total floor area is 2,109 square feet. That includes the garage. The design utilizes shiplap siding on the first story, battened panel and clapboard panel siding on the second story, with a raised seam metal roof and clad windows. The detached garage is 13 feet 11 inches tall. The design complements the residence with shiplap plank siding, a raised seam metal roof, and clad windows. The garage is existing non-conforming because the structure encroaches into the required setback, uh, the rear setback, excuse me. The, the applicant submitted the required non-conforming calculation that demonstrates the alterations do not exceed the allowable 80% of the present fair market value. The applicant is proposing two south-facing decks on the second story. The location of the rear deck allows residents visibility into the adjacent property at 618 Oak Drive. Condition number four has been added to mitigate loss of privacy. This includes a privacy screen, seen here, uh, along the edge of the rear deck facing the neighboring property. The condition also requires the applicant to plant trees along the shared property line. Staff recommends the Planning Commission approve the design permit based on the conditions and findings. Thank you, Sean. Any questions for staff? The privacy screen solid or is it a screen? It's solid from. Let me go back. It's solid from the the rail line, and then there's a semi-solid screen wood slats on this set, the top half. Okay. okay. No. Any other questions for staff? Would the applicant like to speak? No? Okay. So I'll open it up for uh, the public. Now, sir, you can come up and <laughs> sorry for uh, the exercise. Yes, if just so your name is in the room. Thank you. Michael Bertoldo. 
I live at 622 Oak Drive, which is the side which I just learned where the screen is. I'm curious about one thing. Does that go past my deck? It'll be behind you. It mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, south side, yeah. 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 Well, yeah, but so I have a deck that almost comes to the back of their house right now. So I'm wondering, is it going to go further back? the back okay thank you so my concerns are parking during construction and um, the street is very narrow and we have across the street next door to me and across the street from the next door house 621 624 and 705 elderly people that have require ambulance or fire almost once a month and we have construction going on right now down the street a ways. And they use bigger trucks and it tends to block the road. So really my concern is access for emergency vehicles. That being said, during construction, what I would like is if the contractor and subs could park down on the strip next to the Union Bank. I walked it off today, it's about 100 feet and I don't know if you can close it specifically for contractors during the working hours of Monday through Friday. Um, that would be optimum. And I'm speaking for other neighbors. They all call me. Um, but that would alleviate the parking in front of the house, blocking driveways, and access again for the emergency vehicles from both sides. And. Uh, I don't know if they can post signs on the property to um, notify subs as they come in through the project. I don't know if they'll have a meeting at the beginning that instructions for everybody, but if subs come in later that didn't go to that meeting, if there could be signs posted, you know, don't block driveway, um, don't, you know, be, be aware of other people's landscaping and the width of their truck. That would, that's basically it for me. Okay. Okay. I think I have your concern. All right. Thank you, okay. sir. Thank you. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if you want to respond to that. I mean, we can bring it back and we can talk about possibilities with that, but it, if you could come up here and speak, then maybe we could just have a gentleman's agreement to um, do that, or we could potentially make a condition, I guess. But Yeah, my name is Roy Horn. I'm the designer of the okay. project. And I've done many houses in Capitola, a lot of them on very small lots. So I'm, I'm familiar with the problems. Um, in this case, um, the depth of the driveway is 75 foot long. So you know, we'll just have to organize it so whoever needs not get out of the job during working hours is going to park first. And I don't know many lots that are 40 foot wide that have a 75 foot long driveway. So anyway, that's the best we can do. And it's going to be hard to control subcontractors, but we do most of the work ourselves. Okay. But you know, to tell them they're going to park half a block away, um, you know, we do the best we can. But we do have parking in front of the house. Uh, Michael's home, which is right next door. His whole front is nothing but. Um, access for his two-car garages, so there's no parking in front of his house. So we at least have some parking plus the 75-foot driveway. So okay. And Very we'll good. We'll try to be as courteous as possible. We will be as courteous as possible, and we'll make s we'll figure something out. But we have a long, we have a lot of parking there. Just whoever's going in and out is going to be parked on the street. You know. It's okay. Thanks. I, wait, wait, any questions for Mr. Horn? No. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, anybody else like to speak on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back for commission discussion. So we've never uh, imposed a parking condition. Uh, I mean, this is typically a problem. Uh, 
projects on Riverview, projects all over the village have that problem and something that we have to live with. Uh, the sewer project is uh, probably an extreme itself, but I, I think the concern is uh, noted and I think the owners will try to deal with it as best they can, but I don't think a formal condition is in order. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, I would concur with that. I think it's a gentleman's agreement probably is more appropriate here. Yeah, if I may add, um, in order to close a road and make it impassable, they, it, they would have to come in and get a special permit through the Public Works Department. So there is a requirement to keep the, the roads operating and that they, if there's ever a parking violation, it could be called into the city and we could go out and take a look. But they have to follow the rules of you know, the parking regulations as well as a closure would take a permit through the Public Works Department. And I, I think if if I remember correctly, we've had this issue before not too long ago on a close by narrow dead end street that wasn't brought up during uh, our approval, but later there had to be some meeting with a contractor about <laughs> keeping it open for the neighborhood and stuff. So um, I guess if there, it could be complaint driven if there's a problem that way. Right? Um, okay, well, anybody else? Any? No? I'll move approval okay. with as conditioned. Okay, so we have a motion. I have a second. And a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And uh, you're approved. So thank you. And um, Michael, so you understood. Hopefully there's could be worked out with you. And it sounds like with the driveway that long, it shouldn't be a problem. So great. Thank you. Uh, that moves us into the public hearing items. Our first one is 6A on uh, San Jose Avenue. And Yes, uh, I need to recuse myself and explain my reason being that I have property within 500 feet. Thanks. We'll uh, send somebody out after you. <coughs> okay. Uh, this next application uh, is a proposal for an amendment to a conditional use permit for a takeout restaurant with six seats or less to include beer and wine sales. The restaurant is part of the Capitola Mercantile located at 115 San Jose Avenue in the Central Village Zoning District. In the Central Village Zoning District, business establishments that sell or dispense alcoholic beverages require a conditional use permit. The six seats allowed for this use are shown on the floor plan. The current business hours are from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. daily. Alcohol service is proposed from 12 p.m. to 10 p.m. The proposal does not include expansion of floor area or seating. The applicant must have an approved conditional use permit from the City of Capitola before the Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control will allow the Type 41 license to be issued. Chief of Police Terry McManus has reviewed the application and provided a letter of necessity and convenience, which is required by the ABC. Conditions 1 through 4 have been added to the original conditions of approval to ensure compliance with the original CUP and responsible management of on-site sale of alcohol in compliance with the ABC. The proposed takeout has the same parking demand as the previous retail use and unpermitted takeout restaurant. Therefore, the project would not significantly impact the existing parking conditions. However, the shared mercantile parking lot is at capacity and any proposal to add seating will require either increased on-site parking or a study to review the parking impacts. Staff recommends the Planning Commission approve the conditional use permit based on conditions of approval and findings. Okay, very good, Sean. Any questions for staff? No? And then we'll have the applicant. Would you like to speak? No? Not seeing an applicant want to speak? Okay. Then uh, I'll bring it back to the Commission for discussion. Yeah, I'm just curious because it states in the staff report that this can be either on sale or off sale alcohol. <coughs> so they can buy alcohol at this site and then take it outside and drink it. Which is more than likely to occur because nobody's <laughs> going to go there to buy alcohol to take home. It's type 41, right? It's type 41. Type 41 is like for restaurants to so say you buy a bottle and you drink some there, you can cork it and take it home with you. That's what it is? Yeah, it's not It's not truly like a, Going like out a to liquor the store. You're buying it, yeah. capped and but take it to go. Probably the majority of alcohol that's going to be sold here is beer. Yeah, yeah. Beer and wine to drink on site with your pizza. So I think if I go in there and I buy a can of beer, I can take it outside and drink it outside. Not legally, right? But I can legally take it outside from off the premises to drink it. 
don't think beer because beer you can't usually close and take with you in the same way you can with a bottle of wine. I've seen people cork, you know, but 22 ounce beer bottles, but how are they going to control that? <coughs> we don't know. That's the ABC's job. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Any more questions? No, that's just my concern right. because you know we don't allow alcohol in the village anywhere right. on, on public premises, and I realize this is a condition of the ABC rules, right. but it just seems like it's going to add to the problems down in the village. Yeah, I, does do the other takeout? Restaurants serve, do they have? I can't remember if they have alcohol permits or not. Um, some of our other little <coughs> restaurants. So currently, we do not have any to go restaurants that serve alcohol right. um, that are to go food establishments. In the past, there was one at, um, at the same location. Uh, sorry, he's mm -hmm. going to pull up a slide. So Manicomio, uh, which previously occupied Caruso's site, was permitted for a, as a to-go restaurant with <coughs> beer and wine sales. Must have been a while back. 98. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it had, to, that had to be a while back. Yeah. Okay, very good. Well, then uh, I'll bring it back for discussion to see where we're at or a motion. Yeah, I have no more comments. Those are my concerns. Okay. Uh, that sounds like we have precedent, though. This is even though it's 1998 precedent. Well, there's precedence, and then ultimately it's enforced by ABC, but I, I, I share the concern. We can have people grabbing a piece of pizza and a beer and going sitting on the bench, and um, so that would be the concern. Anybody? Come on up. You, come on up, Josh. Hello, friends. How are we doing? Josh, uh, property manager, mercantile, left coast, so all that good stuff. Um, what I think he means by, like, to-go beverage, I think it would be, just like you said, if you happen to buy a bottle of wine and you don't finish it all, just like any, almost any restaurant in Capitola Village, you're allowed to cork it and leave. Um, when he says, like, to-go food, I believe he means like, just like you said, go in there, grab a slice, maybe you want to have a beer or a glass of wine with it. Um, you wouldn't be able to take it to leave. It would be, I think he means like uh, throughout the building or in his establishment, but not just like legally, you're not allowed to go outside just like any of the other bars as well. You're not allowed to go outside unless you have a, a set patio area. So I don't, I don't think it's any like sp special use where you can just grab and go and carry there'll be people working there'll be a cashier there'll be the cooks in there there'll be the bussers in there so just like every other restaurant you know they wouldn't allow you to just go outside but if he can go and wander around the building with his with his alcohol how do, you how do you control that he can't go out any of those exits correct i mean it's the same concern that we have with every restaurant that serves alcohol down here there's potential for that to happen throughout the village and it, it's usually handled by the host or by the you know other we can't guarantee it no one no restaurant can guarantee it either just they're not takeout facilities that's the only difference right yeah. totally understandable though thanks josh okay so i'll bring it back for a motion or discussion i'll move approval i'll second so we have a first and a second and uh all those in favor aye aye, aye. any opposed no and one no. So we have, okay. you want to do a roll call real quick? Sure. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Ruth? No. Commissioner Christensen? Yes. Commissioner Wilk? Yes. Chair Welch? Aye. And then we have one. Thank you. Commissioner. Yes. Good. Very good. Okay. So that passes. Uh, the next item we have is um, 1440 41st Avenue. We got Commissioner Newman coming back. Yes. And now Commissioner Christensen will leave. <laughs> uh, she works for the, uh, to represent a few Fuse Architects, so.
Okay, so we'll do a staff report. Thank you, Chair Welch. Uh, tonight, we have an applicant requesting a conditional use permit to operate and expand Hot Elevation Studios uh, Fitness Studio within an existing commercial space, uh, Four Star Center, located at 1440 41st Avenue in the Community Commercial Zoning District. The yellow rectangle here shows the parcel with the building containing Hot Elevation Studios, and the blue rectangle shows the extent of the three parcels that make up Four Star Center. Sorry, the blue doesn't pop very well. I'll try a different color next time. Four Star Center is located on the east side of 41st Avenue between Helm and Academy Mortgage. The plaza is in Capitola's main shopping district along 41st Avenue, which also includes Kings Plaza, Capitola Mall, the Auto Mall, and several other shopping plazas. Four Star Center is a large commercial parcel with over 300 linear feet along 41st Avenue. The plaza is made up of three buildings in a U shape. There are 111 parking spaces located in the center and in the back corners of the property, shown here in orange, for shared use by all tenants. The commercial spaces are occupied by a range of tenants, including Hot Elevation Studios, Verizon, Max Muscle, Melinda's Bakery, Rain Salon, and Tracy's Nails. The largest commercial space in Four Star Center, however, is the 15,568 square foot rear building, uh, which was formerly occupied by Outdoor World, is currently vacant. Hot Elevation Studios, which offers cycle, TRX, bar, yoga, and Pilates classes, currently occupies Suite E and Suite H, shown here. They're proposing to expand into Suite G, which is in between their two existing locations, which was formerly occupied by a massage business. The expansion involves in an interior remodel that combines Suite E, H, and G, and no exterior changes are proposed. With the additional space, the applicant is proposing to increase their class offerings from 64 to 90 classes per week. Under the Capitola Municipal Code, a fitness studio is considered a personal service establishment. Uh, and personal service establishments entirely within enclosed buildings that occupy more than 3,000 square feet of building area require a conditional use permit within this zoning district. The proposed fitness studio after the expansion will be 4,090 square feet. In issuing a CUP for the fitness studio, the Planning Commission may impose requirements and conditions with respect to location, design, siting, maintenance, and operation of the use as may be necessary for the protection of the adjacent properties and in the public interest. The parking section of the zoning ordinance does not have a specific parking requirement for yoga or fitness club type uses, so in order to analyze parking impacts, Kimley Horn was contracted by the city to prepare a parking study. Utilizing various parking demand rates and standards, the study found that an inadequate number of parking spaces are forecast to be available for the proposed project within the retail center based strictly on the city requirement and industry standards. However, with mixed tenants at strip malls, parking utilization is shared and has different peak times. Therefore, the net demand for parking is usually less than what typical requirements would indicate. Therefore, uh, as such, an actual parking count was conducted to verify availability of parking spaces on the site during peak operating times of the yoga facility. Parking occupancy counts were conducted at 10.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m., the times representing the peak parking demand period when an overlap in hot elevation studio classes would occur. The 5.30 p.m. survey time also happens to be the typical afternoon peak hour for commercial and retail land uses. With project implementation and without including the parking demand of the vacant outdoor world building, the shared parking lot is anticipated to have a total of 94 occupied parking spaces, or 85% of the total. And at 10.30 a.m., uh, 88 space, occupied spaces, which is 79% of the total spaces. Uh, therefore, the existing parking lot with a vacant outdoor world building can sufficiently accommodate the additional parking space demand from this project. Obviously, we also wanted them to look at with outdoor world or something in that space as well. So an alternative parking analysis was conducted to account for the proposed project plus uh, the outdoor world use in that space. The vehicle parking demand for the vacant outdoor world retail store was calculated using sporting goods superstore average parking rates. The retail parking demand is approximately 14 spaces for the 10 to 11 a.m. peak hour and 19 spaces for the 5 to 6 p.m. peak hour. Uh, therefore, with project implementation, the shared parking lot is anticipated to have a total of 108 occupied spaces, 97%, at 10.30 a.m., and 107 occupied spaces, 96%, at 5.30 p.m. 
Therefore, the existing parking supply could sufficiently accommodate the additional parking space demand from this project, even if the Outdoor World store was still open. However, because the largest commercial space in Four Star Center is vacant and the use type of a future occupant is unknown, staff recommends that the Planning Commission include the following condition of approval. And bear with me, it's kind of long. And by the way, the addresses of the other two buildings are 1420 and 1430, so. Parking for 1420, 1430, and 1440 41st Avenue is provided in a shared parking lot. To ensure adequate parking for all tenants at those addresses, uh, is provided on site, a parking study shall be required for any future tenants or tenant expansions that cause the cumulative total parking demand for the businesses on the site to exceed the 111 parking spaces provided. The owner has indicated future plans to increase on-site parking with eight additional spaces, which would increase the total on-site parking to 119 spaces. The threshold for a parking study shall increase to a cumulative total parking demand greater than 119 spaces if the additional eight spaces are constructed. So with that, staff recommends the Planning Commission approve project, uh, the project with the additional condition based on the conditions of approval and findings. Thanks, Matt. Any questions for staff? So, uh, uh, are those three buildings owned by a single landlord? Yes. So um, he's aware of these additional conditions and doesn't have a problem with, that, with those? I mean, if I was the landlord, uh, I would be, well, be wondering, well, maybe maybe I don't, now that you've imposed these conditions, maybe I don't want to approve this yoga studio or whatever, because now you're, you're having trouble, now I won't be able to rent out, out Outdoor World, right? So yeah, I just want to know if he's responded. happy with this whole, mm -hmm. this whole shenanigans. We spoke with the owner's representative yesterday, uh, both Community Development Director Hurley, he and I, um, and expressed, you know, our concerns about the situation. We um, read them the text of the, of the, uh, recommended condition that we were going to recommend to you guys um, and they were okay with us moving forward with this approach thank you Commissioner Newman. yeah i'm not really understanding the condition very well so what you would look at is what the uh, capitola municipal code requires for the particular use mm -hmm. to see whether or not a parking study is required like if we're outdoor world i think it was 52 spaces mm -hmm. would be required but uh Kimberly Horn said they only need 14. Um, so if it's more, wh whatever use, almost, almost any use is going to have the one space per 300, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, do we have any, uh, what kind of use would not have that? So no, most, most uses will come in at one space per 300. The, the idea here is that because it's a mixed use center, they'll study it and make sure that the types of uses will have, will work together no, I get the idea yeah. of a parking study, but I don't get the condition because it's always going to require a parking study. Um, so instances in which it wouldn't, typically if, if retail replaced retail right now, it wouldn't require a CUP and therefore we wouldn't typically take it to planning commission and have a study. But this, if, if a retail establishment comes in and they don't meet the parking on site, a study would be required. Yeah, you lost so, me there again. So um, let's, <coughs> let's, let's take an example. A mattress store moves in. Now, how does this work? So a mattress store would be calculated at one per 300. Yeah. And I'm assuming that would be over the, um, the limit, the, the 111 parking spaces. So therefore, we would hire Kimley Horn to do the analysis um, to ensure that the mattress store could be... I can't Parked think of any use that wouldn't require the parking study. So the condition should just say that a parking study is required for that to fill that space. Because I, I, I mean, I, I, there's no use that I'm aware of in our code for a 15,000 square foot building that requires less than what is it? 20 spaces would put you over the limit. Yeah, the, the, the only one that is what, a, what, a wholesale. What uses can go in there without a parking study? A wholesale establishment, so such as I think there's a hair product establishment next to Pier One that people can buy bulk hair goods there. That a warehouse, like a warehouse, yeah. I, 
this condition is written to cover the whole center too. So you, what we were thinking with that, I think, is that you, you're focused on obviously the, the largest space in there, but we're talking about maybe if like Max Muscle went out and was replaced with another retail, that wouldn't require a parking study because it's already factored in at one per 300 and it's a much smaller space. So that, that's an example of one that would not require a parking study under this. Okay, any other questions for staff? Is the applicant here, would you like to? <laughs> would you like to speak to the commission? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Depends what Maybe. you say. <laughs> there we go. I'll say good evening. Um, my name is Nia Lewis. I work for Fuse Architects and we're representing the client um, who's been running a very successful yoga studio in Capitola and enjoys working here. So just wanted to say good evening. Okay. Thank you very much. So we don't have the property owner here, I guess. So then um, I'll, any other uh, individual like to come and speak on this item? No, I'll bring it back to the commission for discussion. Yeah, I was a fairly regular customer at Outdoor World, and at all those times during the day, I, I've been there, and <coughs> I've always been able to find a parking spot. There might only be one left, or maybe two, but I've always been able to park, so I don't think this is going to create anything different out there than it existed in the past. Well, I just want to acknowledge the the comment from the neighbor who was complaining that already there's spillover of, of parking into his adjacent because I was over there and yeah the the lots all kind of connect and it's easy to it's crowded to spill over into parking that's not for four square center um, but I don't know what else to say other than <laughs> I feel for him. <laughs> the money making opportunity you can make an agreement with the business owners there to sell some overflow parking <laughs> so first I've got a couple of disclosures to make on this one is uh, that I've been a satisfied patron of the business <laughs> for quite a long time although I still haven't mastered my forearm stand <laughs> <laughs> um, it's really great very well run business uh, I think it's terrific um, I also if, if the neighboring property owner who submitted some concerns to us were actually an applicant I would have to recuse myself because I have a business relationship with that party but because they're just a public uh, comment I, I can still participate but I wanted to disclose it so I I am concerned about that uh, overflow parking since I know very well the um, the parking situation there and it sounds like the business has made efforts to keep the um, people using the yoga studio or hot elevation studio from not parking in that area and I think that that effort would have to continue uh, I really honestly I found the Kimberly Horn study not very helpful in the whole approach to it seems like we're talking we're putting peas under pod and I can't find them <laughs> here because they keep changing around from the code section and what it requires to what a parking study requires to what a parking study in Minnesota says to, I mean the whole thing is uh, seems to be sleight of hand but nobody gets hurt for, there's no street parking here so we don't have to worry about people overflowing onto the street the only thing we have to be concerned about is the one neighboring property owner I think and then this this shopping center can do whatever it wants as far as uh, that but I do have I'm going on here I do have a thought about mitigation and I don't I probably doesn't work for the business but I'll throw it out anyway which is the real crunch comes when the class the classes are an hour an hour and a quarter and there's 15 minutes between most of them although there's a three-hour gap in the middle of the day you, you, you are a pretty good organizer with this <laughs> so the problem comes because this is not a regular yoga studio where people finish their yoga and then just jump in their car because they're just beat. They're beat up. So they, it takes them a while to, to exit. So that 15-minute uh, gap between classes is what causes the parking crunch because the people in the, in the previous class have not left yet. Their cars are still in spaces, and the people in the next class have arrived. So. And, you, and if you'll notice at the four o'clock class, it, it's not nearly as severe the parking. 
because you don't have a class leaving. So if it were possible, and I know you don't want to mess with your schedule, but if you're going to re be redoing the whole thing, if it were possible to make the <coughs> uh, interval between classes a half hour instead of 15 minutes, you would tremendously mitigate the parking problem there. In my observation of having lots of 10 plays at the yoga studio. So I don't know, it, I just throw that out. I don't know that we want to make that a condition, but it would really, really help the problem. Uh, that was free advice, by the way, from an attorney, so that's pretty <laughs> rare. Uh, I, I, right now, so I, I look at it really that currently, even though I went to the Kimberly Horn uh, discussion and presentation and findings, the current issue to me is, is today it's going to be we're going to get by. It's, it's when they get this new outdoor world decides to uh, find a tenant for that's when we're going to have really an issue to have the discussion. So currently I think uh, you were given some great advice maybe on clearing up some of the parking issues, but uh, it seems to me today it, um, it's, it's going to pass and it's the property owner's um, I guess issue to have to deal with at some point on what they're going to do when they decide to uh, find a tenant for outdoor world. So I, I don't have a real problem with the current conditions. I understand your concerns about. Well, I'd like to propose and okay. see if see okay. if some of the other commissioners are willing to go along with the condition that imposes a responsibility on the business to make sure or attempt to make sure that the patrons don't park in the adjoining uh, property either by yeah. signage or whatever it takes. That's good. I, I have a question that could be related. Does this center have a master plan? I am not aware of a master plan if it was developed. They have, with they the have a master sign plan, yeah, but I don't think they have plan. a master plan, yeah. Okay, so we couldn't impose a condition on the center as a whole, then, correct? So something that I was thinking of is, you know, they in our conversation yesterday, they talked about moving forward with eight more spaces. They've hired an architect. They've identified room for eight more spaces. That could be a condition on this permit where they are short on parking. Um, if they do come in for that, I think it's just an administrative review. It's um, that wouldn't have to come to the Planning Commission. But so, like so, well, I was just going to ask with the master sign plan program to add additional, obviously that's for business signs, but does it include signage for parking? How would, can we put that in? It's going to affect the whole complex if we put that as a condition? Yeah, so uh, directional signage does not need a permit for to come before Planning Commission, so they could put up directional signage, and we could definitely add that as a condition. So what I would like to see is this is a conditional use permit, which means that it's always subject to review and uh, potential uh, penalties. So I would like to see a condition that says basically that the business will see to it that their patrons do not park in the adjacent property. And if the, if the adjacent property owner finds that's not happening and keeps contacting the city, then that would be you know, something to take up with the owner. Yeah, but on, I'm thinking too, Ed, that if people are using the other parking lot, it may not necessarily be, be related to this business. It could be related to some overflow parking from another business. Property so owner. that's why I'm thinking if, if there could be a condition placed on the whole center rather than one specific business. Whole center doesn't have a conditional use permit. Well, I mean, that's essentially what we were doing with this parking requirement was saying that they've almost maxed out their parking on this site. So any future business that comes in will need, um, if they're going to intensify the use on the site, they'll need a parking study. So I think it's reasonable. I think it's one property owner. It's um, well, they but have the a, a, an office building with uh, lots of. Uh, lots of offices there who come and go and need their parking and have a right to expect to have their parking even mm -hmm. during peak uh, exercise periods. So there's already signage there uh, that says this is parking for the office complex. So isn't there already a laws or ordinances that limit the overflow parking? If, I mean, if, the, if it's, it's already, there's already signage there. It's very difficult to uh, deal with that 
from the standpoint of a property owner if there's ongoing people are very um, selfish about wanting to park their own vehicles when and where they want to and they'll say well I'm just gonna be a minute or I'm just, and, and uh, you don't want to put that on the property owner whose property is being um, misused but but to mix point uh, it seems that it's difficult to pin it on the yoga studio as well how come they're suddenly responsible for whoever parking in that spot um, you know the, 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 the owner could complain that there's a lot of overflow parking ever since that new addition but that's not necessarily their problem that could be because suddenly Melinda's bakery is going business is going through the roof or something I don't know yeah, so I, I, I don't think that's realistic. I think realistically, the uh, what the well, the owner would know when people are getting out of their cars with their yoga mats. Who's I mean, they're not going to be going to those other little stores there as much or, or Verizon. Would you like to try to form a motion with your commission? Yeah, I don't know if I'm getting any traction here or not, but. I understand what you're right, saying, I'm but I, I with the implement implementation. That's all. I'm just trying to imagine right. being the yoga student owner and having to go out there and police those five it, by five. Yeah, I think it's yeah, more if like I may. more of a center issue than one yeah. specific business. Right. There, the, within this conditional use permit chapter of the code, there is, and within our conditions, if there's ever an issue and it's a repeated offense, it's built into the code that we can bring it back to the planning commission. Right. So, that is part of the code. Yeah, so we need a condition okay. that would cause it to come back to the Planning Commission. And I, I don't even think you need that condition. I think it's already built into our ordinance, but if you want to reemphasize uh, it. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm not 100% comfortable with pushing this down the road until somebody comes in with an application in an outdoor world mm -hmm. and then dealing with it at that point yeah, and see, not me there. But you know, the, so the, for me, I kind of see it. I, I hate kicking the can down the road, but at the same point, I, I'm kind of on the fence too. I agree that it's not the uh, applicant's responsibility; it's the business center's responsibility to meet the parking requirement requirements. The property owner has agreed to expand the studio and give them a lease, meaning he's acknowledged in accepting that parking requirement on top of. Uh, the additional required parking which they currently meet so the fact that he has a vacant tenant uh, is so how about this this is pretty uh, uh, mild some sort of <laughs> condition that uh, that says basically that the um, business owner will exert reasonable efforts to assure that the patrons of the business don't park in the adjacent property then that's not replacing this condition then? No. Okay. Would that be okay. acceptable? I'm, I'm okay with that. Yeah, that's fine. Plus it's reasonable. Okay. Yeah. So you want to put that in a motion? Or was that the motion? Well, I'm just throwing <laughs> that out as an extra condition, and I will move approval with that condition and the additional condition that the staff has recommended and all the regular conditions that are in the staff report. Okay, so we have a motion with the new stated did you get the new condition written down um, and staff's conditions uh, do we have a second I'll second we have a second all those in favor aye aye congratulations on your expanded yoga studio <laughs> thank you okay um, that brings us to the director's report thank you um, this evening I have a few exciting things to report um, last Tuesday, we got an application for the new Capitola Town Square, um, a mixed-use development at the location of the mall. So that is in. Um, we're moving along pretty quickly with our new team. Um, we've last uh, two weeks ago at the city council meeting, we signed contracts for uh, JHS planning uh, John Schwarz will be the planning will manage the project through the planning process and we also signed a contract with Cosmont to do the economic analysis next week uh, another contract will be reviewed by the City Council for DUDEC to do the environmental review on the mall application and we're looking at bringing forward a conceptual review in either October or November 
um, of which I'm probably going to be asking you for your second meeting in the month. So look at your calendars, block out the third Thursdays of those two months, just in anticipation. The plan development application has a requirement for conceptual review ahead of the actual application review. So you will be going through the, the exercise of conceptual review of the mall. Um, at this point, we have the application in as soon as We've provided them comments and feel that we have all the necessary information. We'll, we'll disperse packets, but at this time we want to. We're still under the review process. Um, now, before you go on, should we have called Christine back? Courtney, I'm back. Courtney, I don't. She left. She leaves. She I don't know. She left. She left the she first. Stop here. Oh, here she comes. She's, She's coming. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry about that. So the exciting news, Courtney, I'm sure you heard from. Yes, I heard. I heard everything. Okay. Um, so we're moving along, and we'll be. Uh, I'll be giving you regular updates on timelines and for that project. So that's exciting. There's 637 new residential units within the project, and also um, the overall total square footage of commercial is slightly over 600,000 square feet. Um, I've also put out an RFP for a design professional to review the project. Um, and it's under our new code in which we hire an outside consultant to do the design review process. So we're hoping to get kind of a design slash architect group to come in and look at the project holistically. And that may happen before the, at the same time as conceptual review, so you have some... Uh, How do you put out an RFP like that? Do you just put it online and... Or is there a targeted audience? I put it online, and I'm required to uh, provide it to a, a minimum of three consultants that do similar business. So, yeah. So I have it online, and you're welcome to look at it and distribute. Submit so, it. yeah. And submit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, next, on August 22nd, the City Council reviewed the hotel conceptual review, and that was a successful meeting. I think I just want to thank you all for the. Um, the great feedback that was provided, constructive uh, feedback, and we had a similar um, constructive feedback during the city council meeting. Uh, the city manager and I are meeting with the developer in the near future to talk about next steps and whether or not they'll continue to take that feedback and put it into plans in terms of circulation, parking, and all the great feedback they heard. So uh, thank you for that. and. That concludes my updates. The next meeting is on October 3rd, and I look yeah, forward to seeing you then. There's a lot going on. Um, okay, time for commission communications. Uh, just a question uh, on the Swenson thing. So they've expressed a desire to continue? They've expressed a desire to meet with us and talk about the future of the project. So Thank you. Any I'll know comments? more after that meeting. <laughs> okay, any other comments? Um, I'd like just to close with, you know, recently we had some uh, question about one of our commissioners' um, ability to be on the commission. And so just, you know, there's not much in the audience, but for those uh, who are watching, that's going to be reviewed by the city council. Um, but currently, um, the commissioner meets all of our uh, requirements by the city. And, um, and beyond that, uh, I think bring some skill sets that um, are an advantage. So understanding plans, architecture, um, the community. So the person's either lived or uh, worked in the city for 20 years, so it's not like it's a, someone new to the area. She lives with a few blocks outside of the city limits and currently meets all of the uh, requirements. So um, I don't think the city council has yet agendized a date for that hearing to have that discussion, yeah. but uh, that will be upcoming. So um, anyways, my support for the, uh, the commissioner to continue. With that, I'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you.